ever experienced deja vu? Well, it was 2019, and my daughter, Lena, was so excited because she made a new friend at school. Her name was Faria. And Faria, I had met her mother just recently when we were on a field trip, apple picking. We instantly bonded over our multiple children, the fact that we had to cook for all these children, and our unique backgrounds. Faria's mother was a proud Somali Bantu woman who was born in the refugee camps in Kenya long before she immigrated to the United States. I find Lena one day staring up at our bookshelves. She tells me she wants to pick the perfect book to take to read to school the next day for Faria. I look at the bookshelves with her and I realize there isn't a perfect book for her. This bothered me, and let me tell you why. In my friend group, I've always been known as the parent who would say, there's a book for that. <laughs> Struggling to feed your child? There's a book for that. Your kid is jealous of their sibling or other kids? There's a book for that. Your kid is biting other kids? There's a book for that. <laughs> I had pride in being able to find the perfect book in every situation. But that moment, looking at Lena, staring at those shelves, took me back to my own childhood. I am a second generation American, born and raised in Clarksville, Tennessee. I'm sure that was your first guess, right? <laughs> my parents actually immigrated from Bangladesh and our closest Bengali family friends were over an hour away, in Nashville, Tennessee. I had plenty of friends in school and hobbies, but I love nothing more than being with a great book. I love to read. And one day, my parents dropped me off at my favorite place, the library, and I remember staring at bookshelves. And I asked, how come there aren't people that look like me in these stories. I must not be important enough to write about. Have you ever felt like you don't quite belong? Well, fast forward 20 years, I end up going to pharmacy school, I have a family of my own, and I actually work in a job where I get to publish pharmacy textbooks. I'm surrounded by books, so much so that any time I see a book, that represents me or my family in any way, I bought it. I had no idea how much representation mattered to me. But thinking of Faria and looking at those shelves, by lining our bookshelves with people who look just like me and my family, I am perpetuating the same exact problem that I faced as a child, a lack of representation and diversity in books. I had to face myself in the mirror, dig deep, and change something about this. Well, I dug, and it turns out I wasn't the only one talking about this. The publishing world had recognized this lack of diversity in publishing. I'm gonna share a busy slide with you. Don't worry, I'll walk you through it. <laughs> this is from the University of Wisconsin Cooperative Children's Book Center. In 2018, they looked at the books that were published that year. This is a very nuanced slide, but what you need to take away is this. Books about white children, animals, or other inanimate objects far outweighed the number of books about every other child, collectively 23% in 2018. And what's worse, many of the books written for these children were not written by people who had that culture. These statistics beg me to ask one question. How can we raise inclusive and empathetic children? I believe it starts with consciously diversifying our bookshelves, as books can be a powerful yet underutilized tool. Literature has the potential to spark change in people and society. In 1990, Dr. Rudine Bishop coined the phrase windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. In an essay, she defined window books as books 
that give you the idea of being able to see in someone else's world another perspective. Mirror books that allow a reader to see themselves in the story. And sliding glass doors as books that you simply have to read and walk through and become immersed in that world. What books have you read that fall into these categories? Growing up for me, a window book example would be The Diary of Anne Frank. While I couldn't relate to her story 100%, I felt deeply and I learned so much. The mirror books I recall are actually the Bangladeshi folk tales that my parents, my mom and dad, would share with me as a child. They'd often be about animals, but you know what? Every time, and to this day, that I face a moral dilemma, I think of these stories. It actually wasn't until 2003 that I found my first sliding glass door. That's when the book Born Confused was published. It was about a girl, an American-born confused daisy, A-B-C-D. <laughs> a girl just like me, struggling to find her place in America, as well as her daisy counterpart. What would happen, though, if we only stuck to reading mirror books? Well, you would get to see yourself, but too many mirrors can create a hall of mirrors. When this happens, there could be a distortion of reality. You could get lost. And you know what's worse? You could just only hear the sounds of an echo chamber, unable to see the wild and beautiful perspectives of the world outside you. This is why we need windows, to give us a chance to see perspectives outside of our own. What's really remarkable about a window, when the lighting conditions are just right, just as the light is shining through and you are looking out into a different world, you're able to catch a glimpse of your own reflection and have a chance to self-reflect. I'm gonna get a little technical. You can turn a window into a mirror, right? But the inverse of this is not as easy. Think about it, you gotta take that shiny reflective part off of a mirror. When it's done, if you do it, you'd be left with a clouded view. Authors who write books about worlds that are not their own, it's like looking through such a foggy mirror. The results of this, often, misrepresentation and inaccuracies. Aditi Singh, publisher and founder of Raising World Children, shared with me that the big traditional publishers are aware of these issues, as I mentioned before. And actually, as of 2022, the Cooperative Children's Book Center data came in, and now 39% of the books are represented by black, indigenous, and people of color, and the number of authors writing books for their own cultures has increased as well. This is a good thing. Now, one thing you should think about, though, as these big publishers are appealing to the masses, what they typically tend to do is write books that dispel the common major stereotypes about new cultures and new lands. Maybe it's because they want to catch everyone up. But if you're on a journey like me, trying to diversify your bookshelf, wanting to know and crave about the rich, multicultural, multidimensional, intersectional qualities of our friends and peers, you need to know about the daily life of these people that are being written about. Aditi believes books like those, where you can learn about the daily life of another world, have the power and potential to prevent bullying and increase a chance of self-identity. It's the small independent publishers who are from these different worlds that are filling the gap in publishing these books. And as a result, everyone benefits from better representation. Speaking of benefits, let me go over a few more benefits of books. 
Books can help combat bias. Bias formation starts in childhood. Children mirror what they see. It is dependent on who and what children are exposed to in real life, through media, and books. Look, we all have bias, but here's a solution. Try to pick up a book outside your norm. It may change your perspective even just the slightest bit. I'll tell you about one of my biases. I have never liked the taste of lima beans. <laughs> Anyone with me? <laughs> well, my daughters read a book about a girl who loved lima beans. This is Lena, Nadine, and Amina. They made me go buy lima beans. They made a poster. They love them. And you know what? I gave it another try, and they aren't so bad. So <laughs> our brains are remarkable. She's lying. Our brains are remarkable in that we can rewire. And there's something also very special and important about adults reading books with children. There's such an impact, and it's very important to remember. Books can also foster empathy. A couple of years ago, I learned something new. I met author Kelly D. Roberts. She taught me about a condition I had never heard of, even though I was a pharmacist, went to pharmacy school, and I was a medical writer. Oops. Essential tremor. It's a condition in which there's an involuntary rhythmic convulsion of the head, body, and hands. This condition impacts both children and adults. Kelly had just written a children's story about E.T. and told me that there were no children's books out there about this condition for kids who have it. That struck me. And I thought, there should be a book for that. <laughs> books can also prepare us. How many of you have some sort of storage unit, attic, basement, where you put away things? Why is it that we store things? Sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind. Sometimes it's to hide things away. Well, just the way we can hide away things in an attic or in a storage unit, parents sometimes hide certain emotions and feelings from their child, thinking that they want to protect them because they're too young to experience these feelings. Well, here's the truth. Children should actually experience a wide range of emotions in their childhood so they can practice how to cope. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes progress. We must not always seek to protect our kids. We must prepare them. Author and physician Dr. Gabor Mate emphasizes the importance of being able to help children cope with the stresses that they will inevitably face one day. Grief is one of these things we shield from our children. But imagine a world where you are able to equip your children with the tools they need through conversation and stories so they can handle an inevitable loss they one day may face in a healthy way with grief literacy. So what really brought me here today? One last flashback. It was 2021, and I had just finished doing our standard bedtime routine with my dear husband, Humble. We, would, we had just read a book to the girls, and then I escaped to go back into my office to finish some things for work. And all of a sudden, I see Lena, my eldest daughter, now five years old, in the doorway. Mom, can you please read us another bedtime story? I told her that I would. Right after I was finishing up with my work, I might have had a conference call to prepare for. She looked at me and said, never mind, you'll be asleep by the time I'm done. I'll be asleep by the time you're done. And you know, she just slammed the door softly and walked away. That hurt. It stung because I thought I had it figured out. 
I thought I had a balance. And also, my husband and I thought we had the greatest life hack parenting bedtime routine ever. Let me tell you about it. What we would do is we would take turns reading actual stories aloud to our children, and then after finishing reading, we'd press play on a collection of bedtime story podcasts, familiar ones that would help put them to sleep. And we'd just tiptoe away as those stories would play aloud on a bedroom speaker. But according to Lena, that wasn't enough. <laughs> I once again realized I need to do something. I have a lot of these realizations where I have to face myself in the mirror. But you know what? A few days later, Lena proposed something. Could we start our own storytelling podcast? Her dad and I had no choice but to say yes. <laughs> and that is how Salam Storytime, a podcast in which our family reads aloud stories about children around the world, just like the books that we have on our bookshelves, with permission, of course. You know what would happen after this? I really couldn't have imagined. All of this would become my life mission, to help little girls and boys like Fariha and my other children see themselves represented in literature. I left my stable pharmacy publishing career to begin Global Bookshelves International, a publishing company that's independent, that allows empathy, kindness, and community through literacy. I have a chance now to work with people all around the world to publish underrepresented voices and stories, including one on Essential Tremor. You've now heard my winding journey with books. The question I have for you all, what are your bookshelves saying about you? Do you have windows to the world? Mirrors? Sliding glass doors? It's not too late if you have to make any changes. And remember, if you do, there's a book for that. <laughs>